right, all right. I want to welcome everybody at our 288 campus, Friendswood campus, Alvin campus, Webster campus, Pearland campus, online campus, and everybody uh, joining us from the Weibo Bible Church in Weibo, Montana. Are you glad to be in church today? Anybody glad to be in church? Yeah, I hope so. I hope so. A lot of good things going on. And uh, get my paper straightened out here. I... Uh, I'm glad, I'm glad that you're here. Next week, we're, what we're going to do is we're going to begin a two-week series on a subject that is near and dear to the heart of God, and I know it is because he talks about it so much in the New Testament. This, the, the subject of our series is baptism. The name of our series is going to be Team Jesus, and that'll all make sense in the next couple of weeks, but the second weekend of this series, uh, June 22nd, 25th, uh, we're going to have baptisms at all of our campuses, and we are going to celebrate. We're going to celebrate. And if you've not been baptized by immersion, and by that word, I mean all the way under the water, I'm going to ask that uh, you start praying about that and, and thinking about that and, uh, and, and come and learn about that. In fact, here's the deal. We don't baptize little kids at this church because, and, and I'll, t- I'll talk about this in the series, but uh, faith needs to come first. And so uh, a child needs to know what they're doing first. You can't do it for them, right? So uh, what, we, what we do is I think uh, second grade is like the youngest that will uh, baptize uh, a child. But if you have a second grader or third grader or fourth grader and uh, they're interested uh, they're talking about it, thinking about it. Then at every campus at our New Hope Kids check-in, we have a packet, a baptism packet, and it's for a parent to lead their child through just to make sure their child knows what they're doing and knows what it's all about. Because again, we want, we want every kid to know what they're doing when they get baptized. In fact, we want every adult to know what they're doing when they get when they get baptized, hence the series. Uh, So if you want to know more about baptism, come to this series and then consider taking this step of faith. Today, uh, we're going to do this. We're going to finish up our series, Outlier. In this series, we have watched as Jesus has been unafraid, unafraid to engage with the people that everybody else would literally avoid. He has been willing to touch the untouchable. Aren't you Glad that Jesus is willing to touch the untouchable. Aren't you glad? Because once upon a time, some of us were the untouchable, correct? But um, week one, we saw him uh, reach out and touch the dead. Week two, the sinner reached out and touched him. Last week, we talked about the possessed man, uh, which was a wild story. And today, our outlier is the desperate, the desperate. So uh, last weekend, I mean, I've got a quiz for you, okay? All of our campuses play along. Last week, we closed the sermon out, if you were here, and Jesus had just gotten back into the boat. One person, one person <laughs> knows the answer. At least here, one person knows the answer. Probably all the other campuses, everyone knew the answer. I'm going to assume that, but... Jesus had just gotten back into the boat. He's now floating away from the encounter and the man who had been demon-possessed, the the guy that was, and now he's not demon-possessed, the guy that was naked, now he's not naked. He was not in his right mind, and, and now he is in his right mind, and Jesus has left him on the shoreline. He's now floating toward Galilee once again, which is the other side of the lake, and by the way, there are crowds waiting on him. They can't wait for him to get back, and And today what we're going to do is we're going to see two stories because these two stories overlap and I cannot separate them, not that I would, but uh, uh, I can't tell you one story without telling you the other because the one story that I really want to talk about is inside of the overarching story. So we got to get the context with the overarching story and then we'll get to the outlier, the woman in the middle story who was desperate. So basically... um, Two sermons in one today. You're welcome. (laughs) I almost said, you don't have to come back next week. But then I thought, well, somebody will take that seriously. So uh, see you next week, all right? But uh, we'll get to the the outlier in just a few moments. Let's begin uh, Luke chapter 8, beginning verse 40, where it says this. Now when Jesus returned, the crowd welcomed him, for they were all waiting for him. So he's got a crowd, big crowd on the shoreline. And there came a man named Jairus, who was a ruler of the synagogue. And falling at Jesus' feet, he implored Jesus to come to his house. So 
This, 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 uh, this, this situation is also, uh, and this story is found in, in Matthew as well. And in Matthew chapter 9, uh, it says that the boat pulled up to Jesus' own town. Jesus' own town, which would be the town of Capernaum which was his ministry base, which is where Peter lived. But guess what? There's also a synagogue in Capernaum. Now, uh, they know this because, but there it is. They found the ruins of it. Obviously, have stood some things back up, and it's been rebuilt throughout the, the years. But they found the footprint. It goes down all the way back to Jesus' time, which is awesome, which is cool. And, uh, and, and, and amazingly, Peter's house is next door to the synagogue. They're like right next to each other, a little bit of a lot in between, but really real close to each other, right, right next door basically, a, a, a lot down. And uh, it was, Peter's house uh, was known as Peter's mother-in-law's house, but Peter came to live with his mother-in-law and his wife, which there you go, there's a miracle right there. He went to live with his mother-in-law, but... I'm just preaching the Bible here, folks. But, um, <laughs> but both of these places, and, and this is pretty cool, both of these places, the, the synagogue and then Peter's house, are maybe, I'm guessing now, but maybe 100 yards from the shore of the Sea of Galilee. So this, Peter was a fisherman, so this would be where he pulled his boat up to park next to his house before he left for work each day. And all of this is right here. So on this occasion, that Jesus is town now after he left Nazareth, after he got kicked out of Nazareth for claiming to be the fulfillment of Scripture and the Messiah. He got kicked out of his hometown in Nazareth. This is where he does business now and where he, he uh, ministers to folks. And so they pulled up there in the boat. They're met by this guy on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. And here we go. Jairus implored him to come to his house for he had an only, what? An only daughter about how old? 12 years of age. And she was dying. So again, just like last week, Jesus pulls up in a boat, gets out, boom, he goes to work immediately. Here he pulls up in the boat once again and is met by a man who is desperate. But remember, big crowd is waiting, so lots of people around. Second part of verse 42, as Jesus went, the people pressed around him. Uh, This is the ESV, the New International Version says, the crowd almost crushed Jesus. Now, perhaps not literally almost crushed Jesus, maybe figuratively, pressing in on him. I want you to track with me here now. Uh, Jesus is on his way to heal a man's what? Daughter, uh, the daughter is about how old? 12 years old. Okay, keep, keep track of those two things in your mind. Uh, those will be important in just a little bit. Now, uh, enter the second main character in this passage, the, the story that's within a story. And uh, remember, again, crowd pressing in on Jesus. Now, verse 43, and there was a woman who had a discharge of blood for 12 years. And uh, though she had spent all of her living on physicians, she could not be healed by anyone. So Jesus is uh, going to Jairus' house to uh, heal his 12-year-old daughter. And there's a woman in the crowd who's been suffering for 12 years. Same amount of time that, that this little girl has been alive. Now, Max Lucado wrote about this situation. And uh, he says this. He says... The woman's chronic menstrual disorder would have been difficult for any woman of any era. But for a Jewess, nothing could be worse. No part of her life was left unaffected. Sexually, uh, she could not touch her husband. Maternally, she could not bear children. Domestically, anything she touched in her house would be considered unclean. Spiritually, she was not allowed to enter the temple to worship. Physically, she was exhausted. Socially, she was ostracized. So you've got two people uh, uh, with two very different situations. Uh, In fact, there were a whole lot of differences between the two. Here's here's a few of them. The man's name was given. The woman uh, is anonymous to us at least. The man had been blessed with 12 years of joy. The woman has experienced 12 years of misery. 
Uh, the man was a ruler in the synagogue, so he got to go there every day. The woman was not allowed inside because of her issue. The man's daughter uh, was in a life-threatening state, the woman not necessarily. The man came immediately to see Jesus when his daughter took a turn for the worse. The woman has been suffering for 12 years. This is Jesus' home base for ministry, and yet only now she comes to Jesus. And, and, and let me just say something here. The good news is she came to Jesus. And I say that because whether it's her first choice or her 50th choice, the important thing for all of us is Jesus is our choice eventually before it's too late. Amen to that? Before it's too late. And I know that probably we all know someone who is on choice number 75, but it's not Jesus. And our heart hurts for them and yearns for them. And we know the answer and we want them to make the right choice. And so let's do this. Let's keep praying for those people, all right? Pray for them every single day that, that ultimately they would make the choice of Jesus. So many differences in their stories, but let me show you a few similarities. And as we go along, uh, I'm going to make some applications, all right? So the first similarity here is both were desperate. Both were desperate. Jairus, this, this dad, was frantic because this little 12-year-old daughter was very sick. And I, I can understand this. I can understand this. And if you've, if you've ever been uh, with your child when they're very, very uh, critically ill, if you've ever watched your child be loaded into the back of an ambulance, if you've ever um, been in the ICU with your child or... You've sat in the waiting room next to the surgical suite as the doctors were inside performing some hopefully life-saving surgery on your child. Then you know what you know, and what you know is this. Nothing else matters at that point. Nothing matters. It's like, how's your 401k? It doesn't matter. How my 401k is doing? Nothing else matters. Does the house, do we need to paint the house? I don't care about the house, right? Am I right? Anybody been through this and you know, nothing else matters except that your child is okay. And so we talk about being desperate. This man, Jairus, was there. He was desperate and he could feel it all slipping away. His world was changing. And when he saw it slipping away in that instant, he knew that he had to get to Jesus. He had to find Jesus and for us, you know, this is easy. We're Christians. We worship Jesus. We know that Jesus is the answer. But Jairus, in this slice of time, okay, he's a, he's a religious leader. But in this moment in history, the religious leaders were not on board with Jesus. They, for the most part, had rejected Jesus. And that's the team that Jairus was on. Some of those religious leaders were even plotting to kill Jesus. And that's because they saw Jesus as their competition. They, they did not believe that he was the Messiah as he claimed. But when this guy's daughter became critically ill, he broke ranks with his peers and he went straight to their competition, Jesus. Now, maybe he would have been a little bit more resistant if it was just a cold, like if she wasn't that sick. But uh, her condition made him desperate. And it didn't matter anymore what his peers thought. It didn't matter what, you know, people would say, kind of like Denzel Washington in, in the movie Man on Fire, if you've ever seen that. He had to do what he had to do. And uh, he knew that he had to get to Jesus. And Jesus was obviously touched by his desperation and by this need. And so immediately Jesus heads toward Jairus' home. And that's when they encounter the second person in this story, the woman who had the issue of blood for 12 years. And uh, this same story appears in the book of Mark. And in Mark's version of the story, we get another detail that we don't get in Luke's version of the story. This is Mark chapter five, verse 26. It says, she had suffered much under many physicians and had spent all that she had. Now, again, Mark includes this. Um, Luke does not include this. Why wouldn't Luke include that? Well, I don't know for sure, but I do know this. Luke was a physician. 
Luke was a doctor, Dr. Luke. And so maybe he didn't want to include this for a personal reason. So let's put it that way. <laughs> but I will say that back in the day, it was uh, easy to suffer under the care of physicians. And I say that because they didn't have the understanding of science that we have nowadays. Thank God for that. Thank God for our doctors and nurses who uh, have figured a lot of things out. And there's a lot of diseases that used to just be a death sentence for people. And now there's a fighting chance in many cases for those folks. Thank you, God, for that. Uh, but that's because we, we have science and we believe in the science. And by the way, we're getting off a little bit, you know, uh, uh, medical science and the medical field has kind of crept over into social sciences. Like you go to the doctor now, if you're filling out a form that you first have to choose what you identify as a patient. How about that? I identify as a patient. And uh, anyway, it is, it is so, so please Lord help us to get back on track to the real science. Amen to that. So anyway, back in the day, they didn't have the real science. And so uh, they just kind of made it up. It feels like as they went along. And I have some actual remedies from the Talmud. The Talmud is the book that was used by the rabbis back in the day. And it actually in, included in the Talmud some ways to doctor people for certain sicknesses. And it includes in there uh, how to doctor a woman who maybe has the issue that this woman had. Here's a, a few examples. And it's written kind of weird because it's old, right? But it says, take of gum Alexandria, of alum, and of crocus hortensis, the weight of Azusa each, let them be bruised together and given in wine to the woman that hath an issue of blood. But if this fail, take of Persian onions, nine logs, Boil them in wine and give them to her, give it to her to drink and say to her, arise from thy flux. <laughs> Surely that would work. <laughs> but should this fail, set her in a place where two ways meet. So they're putting her in the middle of an intersection. <laughs> and let her hold a cup of wine in her hand. And uh, wine seems to show up a lot in these remedies, by the way. Which, and these remedies didn't work, so I'm just going to say it. Wine ain't going to solve your problems, okay? So <laughs> let her hold a cup of wine in her hand and let somebody come behind her and affright her. So scare her and say to her, arise from thy flux. So now they're treating it like, I don't know, hiccups or something, you know. <laughs> but should this do no good? Uh, why wouldn't that do any good? Why, I don't know. But should this do no good, take a handful of cumin, which is like parsley, and a handful of crocus, and a handful of fenu Greek, and let these be boiled together and given to her to drink, and then say, arise from thy flux. <laughs> but should this also fail? <laughs> And uh, now it's real embarrassing. Dig, dig seven trenches and burn in them some cuttings of vines not yet circumcised. So vines that are under uh, four years old. And let her, uh, and take her uh, with a cup of wine in hand. <laughs> and let her be led to the first trench and set down over it. So she's straddling the the trench, I guess the smoke smoldering up her gown, I, I guess. And then let her be removed from that and set down upon another and then another and then another. So from trench to smoking trench to smoking trench and in each removal say unto her, arise from thy flux. You feeling sorry for her? There's uh, another one. Um, she was supposed to. She was supposed to go into the stall of a she donkey, feed the she donkey barley corn, come back the next day, get the poop of the donkey, the manure, dig through the manure, and pull out the half-digested 
barley corn, put it in a pouch and carry it with her, and that was supposed to heal her. And if she was here right now, I would just say, I am so sorry. I am so sorry. I mean, you think about that. What if that was your wife or your daughter spending her money, trying to get well, and they're telling her, go dig through donkey poop. Nothing worked. And uh, she used up all of her money trying to get well, but nothing has worked. In fact, she was no better, but rather grew worse. So she's lived as an outcast. She's uh, viewed as unclean. She's probably weak. She's low on iron. She's uh, burned through all of her money. 12 years, 12 years it's been like this. 12 years is an unclean person who can't hardly do anything. She is an outlier and she's desperate. But I want you to hear me now, okay? And, 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 and you're gonna think I have no compassion in my heart whatsoever, but then hopefully this is gonna make sense. Her condition was obviously not life-threatening. Am I right? 12 years with this. Now, I say that like, like maybe you're pushing back a little bit, but if you were at the ER and some woman came in and said, I've dealt with this for, for a while, and how long? 12 years. Okay, so you're, you're the administrator. You're supposed to take care of the doctor's time and send to him the most critical patients, make the other ones wait. And she said, 12 years I've been dealing with this. You go, okay. And then Jairus comes in with his 12-year-old daughter about to die. You would send him back immediately and make this woman wait. So as I'm saying, it's not life-threatening necessarily, which means in the grand scheme of things, it's not the... It's not the big need. It would be down on the, on the list. Which brings up a question in my mind that it's one that I used to struggle with, don't struggle with anymore, except for moments every now and then. Do you ever feel guilty praying for little things? Do you ever feel guilty praying for little things? A couple weeks back, um, I was I was. I'm, bu- I'm busy, okay? I'm busy, and I'm, I'm, we're getting ready to shoot the movie series for the fall, and so I've got to get it done, and I'm working on it and, and, and working hard. I'm, I'm not crying on your shoulder. I'm just trying to frame this. And I've got, you know, sermons for the weekend, but I'm also planning out the baptism series and also the vision series for before the movie series. I'm working, 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 working hard. And I'm tired. I'm tired. And... And I just prayed, God, I got to get this done. You got to help me, Lord. I'm tired. And then it hit me. I, I remembered because I'd been out on the prayer wall at our church. And, and uh, I'd been going through some prayers that people had posted. And here, I just I brought it up. Okay. Pray for my daughter who has autism. We're hoping that she can make a breakthrough and be able to communicate and speak. Pray for family member dealing with addiction. Pray for my marriage. Um, pray for a premature baby. Somebody addicted to alcohol. Pray that so-and-so be healed from depression and mental illness that try to take over his body and mind. It's on our church prayer wall, these kinds of prayer requests. One after another after another. And so, and by the way, go pray for these folks. Go pray for these folks. If you don't know how, go to our website, click prayer, and then click I need prayer. Maybe you don't think you need prayer, but go ahead and click I need prayer because that takes you to the wall and then you can pray for these requests. And once you've prayed, you just click I prayed and that person gets an email that somebody prayed for them, which is pretty cool and incredibly encouraging. So back to my story. I'm like, God, I'm kind of (laughs) tired. Help me, Lord. And, and, And then I remembered those kinds of prayer requests on the wall that I had just visited not too long before that moment. And I felt like such a wimp. I was like, seriously, dude, you're gonna pray, you're a little tired. 
Are you going to be okay? You're going to make it, Pastor? Can I get you a cup of coffee? But as quickly as I had that kind of guilty thought, you know, praying for something that wasn't a big thing, almost immediately after that, I remembered something awesome about our Lord. That he wants to hear from us no matter whether the situation is big or small. That our God is big enough that if we have a big need, he can handle. If we have a small need, he can handle. He wants to hear from all of us, and he can hear from every single person in our church and in our community and in our world at one time, and he can process all of those prayer requests and help those folks and help us as well. And it honors him. It honors him when we trust him with our prayers. Big or small, God wants to hear them all. So how did I get to that from the story? Well, here's how. Jesus is rushing to save a life. And he stops to make a life better. You with me? He was going to save a life, but he stops to make somebody's life a little bit easier. That's because we have a big God. He can take care of any issue for anybody at any time. Both were desperate. Another similarity, both had faith. Now, Jairus had studied the Old Testament prophecies about the Messiah, and uh, even though he was on the team that didn't believe that Jesus was the Messiah, maybe he broke away and said to himself, what do I have to lose? If this is the Messiah, I'm going, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna reach out to him. This woman showed faith too. In fact, in verse 44, it says, she came up behind Jesus and she touched the fringe of his garment. Now, why touch the fringe of his garment? <clears throat> Here's a possible reason. In the Old Testament, when Malachi was prophesying about the Messiah coming eventually, he uses this metaphor about the Messiah. He says, the son of righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings. <clears throat> now, Jesus is not an S-U-N. He's an S-O-N, right? And Jesus does not have wings. But the Hebrew word for wings in this verse is the word kanof, kanof, kanof. Say that with me, kanof. Okay, so uh, accent on the second syllable, please. Kanof, kanof. And do your hands like this too. Kanof, okay. But this is, the word kanof is used to describe, and this is straight out of the Hebrew dictionary, out of a Bible program, Kanoff, because you read it that way. Wing, extremity, edge, wing, border, corner, shirt, wing, extremity, skirt, corner of garment. Kanoff. Kanoff. So follow me now. Maybe this woman knew the prophecy that the Messiah would come with healing in his wings or in the corners or the fringe of his garment. And so her reaching out to Jesus and just touching the fringe was another way of her saying, I believe that you are the Messiah. Why? Because there's healing in his wings. And even though Jesus is being squeezed by this crowd, this outlier reaches out through the crowd and she touches him in faith. And her faith is what made the difference. Faith always make the makes the difference. So both had faith. Another similarity is this. Both went public. At the risk of losing friends and, 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 and status in the community, Jairus came to Jesus in a very, very public way. This woman, on the other hand, kind of snuck up behind Jesus, touched his garment. I assume she would not have minded if this encounter would have stayed private, but watch what happens. This is verse 44. She came up behind Jesus and uh, touched the fringe of his garment, and immediately her discharge of blood ceased. Jesus said, who was it that touched me? When everybody around denied it, Peter said, come on, come on, master. Uh, you got a crowd around you. Everybody is pressing up against you. And Jesus is like, nope, nope, somebody, somebody touched me. For I perceive that power has gone out from me. And so Jesus puts, puts her on blast, okay? <laughs> she, she maybe had kind of wanted to do this privately, 
But that's not how it works with Jesus. Verse 47, and when this woman saw that uh, she was not hidden, she came trembling and falling down before him. She declared in the presence of all the people. She went public. She declared in the presence of all the people why she had touched him and how she had been immediately healed. Now remember, Jesus is on his way to see a man's what? Daughter. Daughter. So I want you to see how Jesus responds to this woman. And he said to her, daughter, daughter, your faith has made you well, go in peace. So we got Jairus who cared desperately about his 12 year old daughter. And then we got a daughter of God here that Jesus cared about even more. In fact, you think you love your kids, Jesus loves your kids more, do you know that? A million times more. And he loves you more than you could ever imagine. And Jesus loved this woman and he saw her faith. Now, uh, question, why did he force her to go public? Why didn't he just kind of turn around and go? <laughs> I got you. I got you. Why, why did he force her to, to go public like this? Why didn't he just let her remain anonymous? Because everyone Jesus calls, he calls publicly. He calls publicly. There are no undercover Christians. Some might say, well, my faith is private. Well, then it's not Christ-like faith because real faith shows up in public. Jesus said this in Matthew 10, everyone who acknowledges me before men I also will acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. That's good news. Here's the other side of that same coin. But whoever denies me before men, I will also uh, deny before my Father who is in heaven. Listen, our faith needs to show up in real life, especially nowadays. Man, our world is going to hell in a handbasket. And too many Christians are quietly watching it happen not being a light for Christ. There are people around every single one of us who are confused and hopeless, and we have the light of Jesus Christ inside of us. It's time for us to let it shine, Amen. to just let it shine, to just. I'm not talking about getting in arguments all day long. I'm just talking about being a witness for Christ, telling somebody that he's the answer, telling somebody what he did for you in your life. And, you know, when she went public, I think it probably helped Jairus too because Jesus is on the way to Jairus's home. And uh, here comes the messengers from Jairus's home with bad news. Verse 49, while, he was still, while Jesus was still speaking, someone from the ruler's house came and said, uh, your daughter's dead, do not trouble the teacher anymore. But Jesus on hearing this answered him, do not fear, only believe and she will be well. Then he proceeds to go to Jairus' house and he healed the daughter. Two stories in one. But let me draw your attention to one more takeaway that I really want you to get today from our outlier. This is the woman who'd been an outcast, an outlier for 12 years. She was impure. She was impure. That's what the Jewish law said. That's what the teaching said. And someone who was impure, if they touched someone who was pure, then the pure would become impure. You understand? So if an impure person touched a pure person, the pure person would become impure. And it makes perfect sense. If you went to uh, wipe down your car and your car was uh, pretty clean, but you took a muddy sponge to wipe your car down with, what's the result? Your car would be dirtier and, and the sponge would not be clean. So normally, the impure makes the pure impure. Yet, when it comes to this impure outlier, she reached out, she touched Jesus, which should make Jesus impure, but that's not how it works with Jesus. Thank you, God. That's not how it works with Jesus. It's not how it works with Jesus. With Jesus, when someone comes in faith and reaches out and touches him, he stays pure. 
But that person who reaches out in faith to him also becomes pure. Sins forgiven, record cleared, which is an important thing, folks, because someday we're gonna stand before God and you don't wanna stand before God with sin on your record. And you don't have to because Jesus will give you his record of righteousness. And that's what he did at the cross. He took our record of sin on himself on the cross and gave us his record of righteousness. And now because of Jesus, we can all stand before God someday, holy, righteous, blameless, without blemish in the sight of almighty God. Thank you, Jesus, for that, that the impure are made pure in Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, one more thing, if you have not done so, I would encourage you June 22nd, 25th, to acknowledge your faith in Jesus in front of people through baptism. And uh, all of our campuses, we're gonna be baptized in every service. Everybody that wants to be baptized, come on, come on, man. And uh, let's go public in our faith and acknowledge him before men and be acknowledged before his Father in heaven. I want you to stand with me, please. All right, so today, if you need prayer for anything, 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 you need to make a decision, you need to rededicate, whatever it is, uh, prayer partners will be at the front of the room as we are done with the service. You can kind of work your way against the flow of people to the front of the room and visit with the prayer partners and they will help you out today. Let's bow. God in heaven, thank you for your love as evidenced through Jesus and what he did for us, Lord. I pray that if there's anyone here today who needs his touch, that today would be the day. I pray this in your son's name and all the people said. God bless, guys. We'll see you next time.